Does God hide the truth? Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. In last week's reading, we saw that the great masters themselves counsel discretion in the dissemination of truth. The counter-argument is sometimes made, but the Lord doesn't hide. He reveals his beauty in the sunsets, his tender sympathy in the rain, his wrath in the thunder, his restless energy in the brooks, his power in the sunlight. There are exoteric truths and there are also esoteric truths. There is that which is revealed impersonally and left up to us to interpret, such as the thunder and our perception of it as divine wrath, the rain and our perception of it as God's sympathy. But behind even God's most open expressions, there lies impenetrable mystery. The wind blows where it wills, said Jesus in chapters 3 of the Gospel of St. John. You hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. And Sri Krishna says in the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Be me, the whole vast universe of things is spread abroad. By me, the unmanifest, in me are all existences contained, not I in them. God's hidden reality cannot be understood by the reasoning faculty. India's Shankya philosophy states frankly, Ishwar Ashida, God is not provable. A willingness to seek the underlying reality behind appearances is essential for those who would know God. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Sunday to everyone. Are we fresh? Do we feel the breeze of the ventilator maybe? In the in the history of art there's something curious. It happened in Renaissance, the Renaissance. Uh, many beautiful things happened, but before Renaissance, the painter, the artist, even if he signed his works, would never show himself from inside. Whereas in Renaissance, the painters, the artists, put themselves into their paintings. Did you see maybe in Florence the paintings of Botticelli? Who saw his uh, figure? It's in the first, uh, really in the first plane of his picture. Or Michelangelo, him, he too, many times. Who saw in Florence the pity in Florence, in the museum of the Duomo. Just a few. You need to go see it. The museum, it's the most beautiful museum in all Florence. And these are the uh, art pieces of the Duomo. And it's behind that church, so it's wonderful. And there we also see his work of his pity. And you can see uh, Joseph who's f holding uh, the crucified Jesus in his arms. Um, do you know this? Do, do you remember the face of Joseph in that 
opera and it's the face of Michelangelo or in one of his uh, greatest operas in the Vatican, another artist put himself behind a pillar uh, between Pitagoro and another personality. So in the Vatican, in the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo uh, painted himself in a little funny way because he made a self um, painting of himself in the hands of Saint Bartolomeo where he has this very strange uh, look upon himself. He looks exhausted and he was exhausted in that moment when he did the painting. So in that chapel we can see a representation of God. How is that God? of Michelangelo, like this. And uh, apart from the, the, the beard, what does he do? What does God do in that painting? He judges. It's God who judges, the God of uh, revenge. And it's not a very pleasant God in that uh, opera in that uh, art piece, but God is not like that because God hides in all his creation and he plays. God is playful and he plays hide and seek. And all this, all his creation is called the Lila of God. Lila means the play of God. So how do we play hide and seek? I learned yesterday that in many countries uh, there are different ways of playing hide and seek, but in the beginning it's all the same, right? So what do you do? There's one person, uh, the, the main character, let's say, and then there's many others. So what do the others do? They hide. Where do they hide? Where it's difficult to find them. So they also go uh, away, they hide underneath something. And then there's the main character closing his eyes and he counts. Do you play like this in Italy as well? So you close your eyes and then you count. One, two, three incarnations, five incarnations, a thousand of incarnations. And then we open our eyes and we want to find God. We want to find him who, is, who has hidden. But God is like a chameleon. Chameleon. He's transforming into many different things. We already heard this mo morning in the song, in the chant. Oh God beautiful, oh God beautiful. We sang that God hides in nature, in every atom of his creation. He hides in nature. And this chant of Yogananda is so beautiful and so strong. And it's interesting because Yogananda sings in the forest, thou art. So what, what does he say? What is God? He's not a tree. He's not the forest. What is he? He's green. So he is the essence of the forest in the mountain. What is he? Hi. What else? So in the mountain thou art high, what comes next? In the river. He's not fresh, he's not the river. He is movement. He's restless. And in the ocean, he is grave, very deep. And so we see that God is the essence of everything. And who continues to closing his eyes, or who, no, who opens his eyes and wants to play with God, should see nature not only for, his be for its beauty, because nature can also sometimes not be that beautiful. There are volcanoes who explode. There are uh, 
wood fires, so sometimes it's not so beautiful. But we need to look for God behind. We need to look for His essence in everything. Swami Kriyananda wrote a chant, which is called Channels. And in that song, he nominates different aspects of nature. And he tells us how God hides himself in nature. So, so he says, in the mountains, God is high. In the flowers, God is the fragrance. Even when the flower dies in the tree, God is the inner strength, the perseverance. And I think, I don't know, but maybe you Swami, when he wrote this song, and Yogananda, when he wrote, Oh God, Beautiful, I believe that they were inspired by uh, a phrase from the Bhagavad Gita. This is from chapter 7 in the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna says, I am the fluidity of waters. Try to close your eyes and feel, perceive what Krishna says here. I am the fluidity of waters. I am the light of the moon and the sun. I am Om in all the cosmos. I am the manhood in a man. I in man. I am the wholesome fragrance of earth. I am the radiance of fire. I am the life of every creature. Know me, O Arjuna, to be the seat of all creatures. I am intelligence in the discerning, in those who are glorious. I am their glory. God hides also in people. Sometimes more difficult to see, to find God. Isn't that true in people? There are people whom we love and others we don't. There's a tradition in India for uh, couples when they get married. The, uh, the bride um, has a guirland of flowers and they're very big flowers in India. So before the ceremony, the bride takes, puts this guirland of flowers on the groom and the groom puts one on the bride. And that is a symbol of the respect of God who is within the other person. And only after that moment, the ceremony can start, which will last two or three days. But it's that gesture of respecting the divinity in the other that is so important. When Arjuna and I got married, we uh, created a small girland ourselves uh, of um, uh, field flowers. And before the ceremony with Swami Kriyananda, we put um, ourselves, the girland, on the other person, and then we touched each other's feet. And we try to always remember that we share with God in our relationship, because God is love, and God loves us through others. But as I said, it's not always easy. Not all are 
like Arjuna, like my husband. Um, we need to admit that. There's the story of a disciple of Yogananda, and he found a beautiful woman, and he wanted to marry that woman. He did not ask for approval from the master because he had already decided. So he asked master for his blessing. And master said, Yogananda said, I will give you my blessing and let's hope for the best. After a few years, they separated. And that this time the disciple comes back to the master and asks him to choose a wife for him. And after a while, Yogananda invites this man to some activity and says, do you see that woman? That is she. No, no, no. That can't be. She is big. She's not really beautiful. And Yogananda says, no, no. That's the one for you. And they stayed together the whole life. It is not easy to see God in others. There's another story. I don't know if it's true, but it doesn't matter because it has a nice moral. It's the story of a priest in a monastery who is a bit down. There are only seven brothers, monks, they're all old, there are new, no new monks. And this priest, the head of the monastery, wants a counsel how to get this monastery going again. And he has a very good friend who is a, a rabbi, a very wise rabbi, and they are friends. And so this uh, head of the monastery goes to the rabbi and uh, explains the situation and says, Rabbi, what can I do here? And the rabbi thinks for a moment, goes deep inside, meditates in silence. And after half an hour, approximately, he opens his eyes and says, oh, I felt something. Jesus is incarnated in your monastery. He's one of the monks. And the priest is surprised. And he thinks, it can't be Joseph, the cook. No, he cannot. He's not a very good cook. He doesn't make a good bread. Or Robert. No, he can't be. He's a bit stupid. But being a wise counsel, the priest goes back to the monastery and tells the monks, the rabbi said that one of us is the incarnated Jesus. And from that moment, each one changed behavior towards the other person. And they because it could have been, maybe it is Joseph, or maybe it is Robert, then it's better to treat him well, if that could be Jesus. I don't want to have a negative thought against him. And in a very short time, that monastery has developed a great magnetism and attracted many new people. There's the tradition in India of Lord Krishna. You know Lord Krishna, right? It's an incarnation of Vishnu. And it is sad that he was all for all. And he just played different roles to help us understand that God is in everyone. He was the child of his mother, Yoshoda. He was friend of the gopis. And they played with Krishna together, like we want to play hide and seek with God. Here's another story, a classic story from the scriptures. And it talks about Krishna when he's young, maybe 14, 15. He played the flute. So this is very symbolic of the calling of God 
from where he is hidden. So when the, there's the full moon, he goes to the river Yamuna and starts playing his flute. And this sound of his flute attracts all these women, the gopis of the village, and they run towards him. And in that moment, whatever they were doing, if they were cooking, they would leave uh, the fire burning. If they were in pajamas, doesn't matter, they would go because they wanted to see and dance with Krishna. So Krishna was in the midst in, of these gopis, of these devotees, and he started playing the flute, and they would dance around him, and each one of the gopis saw Krishna at her side, dancing with him. So that is the great miracle of the Raslila that happened in Brindavan. And you can go to Brindavan, to India, to see this place. And it is so strong of vibrations that it is closed by night um, because no one can go there. There are mysterical, mysterious things happening there at night. So Krishna was also a relative, a cousin to the Pandavas. He was a teacher, a king, a diplomat. He was all. And in this way, he could teach and guide others. If we try to find God, if we seek God, we will find that every day through someone we f see him. And I want to give you this challenge. Let every day God reveal himself through someone to you. Every day. And in this week, try to see this person, how God reveals to you every day. It could be a word, a touch. Uh, an idea, a superconscious guidance. <laughs> Many of us, we have this thought, oh no, we were not here when Yogananda was alive. And maybe we are a little sad. But the truth is, because Yogananda being cosmic, he hides in many ways, in many things. And we can find him if we search for him. Where does he hide, Yogananda? In the autobiography of a yogi who read that book who've read it more than one time, more than three times. We find him there. And he said, Yogananda said, this book is so important because I put my vibrations in this book. It is a living book. It is so rich of his presence. And we find him in his poetry, in Whispers from Eternity. Who read this book at least a little bit? I really encourage you to read it. He said in one of his poems, when you cannot see me with your physical eyes anymore, I will talk to you through the Whispers from Eternity. So open these books and see him find his guidance, his comfort, his presence. Yogananda is very present in his chants, the cosmic chants. We chanted this morning, Oh God beautiful, Oh God beautiful. And Yogananda chanted this chant very often. And once when he had a seminar, in front of thousands of people in New York, in Carnegie Hall. I think it was two or three thousand people. 
And he guided these people in chanting, Oh God, beautiful, in English, for over an hour. I think they chanted for one and a half hours. And so many people perceived God in that moment. They touched God. And I want to read to you what Yogananda says about his cosmic chants. Each of the cosmic chants has been spiritualized. It has been sung aloud and mentally until it has found actual response from God. Let's think about this for a moment. Yogananda chanted each song until he did not receive a response from God. So he created a pathway, a vibrational pathway from the chant to the hidden God. These chants properly repeated will bring God communion and ecstatic joy. And through these, the healing of body, mind, and soul. So Yogananda hides in these ways. He hides also in the practices that he brought, especially in energization exercises. And when we energize, in an automatic way, maybe thinking about something else or doing them uh, quickly to, do, uh, to go to meditate, then we cannot see God or Yogananda behind these energization exercises because this is a gift from him. He is inside each exercise and through this practice he gives us the touch of energy of God as power. Each practice could bring us or could bring us an experience of God as power, as love, as joy. The practice that He brought us. The Hong So practice is such a great gift because there we can find God that exists in between the two movements. He is in that point of stillness when the breath exits and doesn't re-enter immediately. There's God. Or when it enters and doesn't want to exit for a moment, there is God in that moment of stillness so we can deepen this practice to touch God in the heart of every atom of his creation and Yogananda called that the Christ consciousness the, la um, the last moment I want place I want to talk about where God hides is inside of us. One name of God is Vasudeva. It's a name of Krishna, but this is a beautiful name because Vasu means the one who lives within me, within my heart. And when we are inspired by nature, by messages from the superconscious guidance or through others. And if then we can go inside, we find God who is Vasu Deva, that divinity which is inside of each one of us. And each one of us, every soul, and we all are soul, we are 
not only individualized expression of God, we are unique expressions of God. What does that mean? It means that there has never been anyone like you. No one. It's only you who can realize your uniqueness. God is chanting through you a unique song. He's expressing his creativity through you in a unique way. And the goal of our life is to find these ways in which God is expressing himself through our uniqueness. And this is the goal of life. So, who searches for God will find him, hidden even in the poorest of the poor, in those in prison, in those who are hungry, who are thirsty, everywhere. But we need first to open our eyes and search for God who is playing with us. And this is the secret God wants to be found. We will end with a poem from Whispers from Eternity. I am here, solitary, wandering on the beaches. I can see the waves. I saw you agitated, choleric, strong that I left you, and I went wandering inside. And a, a tree comforted me. I'm sorry, I don't have the text. <laughs> this tree was moving his uh, branches so sweetly, singing a lullaby. So I looked up and I saw a mystic blue sky. Like a child, I started searching for you to play a new play with you. But you hid yourself underneath the, um, the angry waters of the sea and the moving branches. But I could no, they're about to touch you. You hid again. I was exasperated looking for you in ignorance that is so old as time. In the end, I stopped looking for you, desperate. How could I ever find you if you always kept running away? You, that you are in everything, but you don't seem to be anywhere, lost in the space that no one can really touch you or contemplate you. So I stopped looking for you, and desperately I went away from you, turning my shoulders, my back towards you, because nothing worked again and again. Silently, uh, the sea kept being angry in uh, this thunderstorm. I looked up again into the silent, vast blue sky. Silence also in the mountains. Silence everywhere. As a child, I just stopped looking for you as a mad child until unexpectedly all of a sudden a hand from the sky would come down towards me and 
open my eyes and I regained my strength and I looked again around me and all of a sudden I saw a sea smiling toad I could see behind the screen of, uh, of life. I could see someone with whom I, I could hear someone whom I couldn't see. Hey, friend of my play, I am here. Thank you. 